Food. You guys have any last questions or concerns before we get into change direction? Or multi-directional training? How do we feel with multi-directional warm-ups? Good. What do they look like? Someone raise their hand and I'll call on somebody. Do a lot of side-to-side. A lot of side-to-side side movement, right? Lateral so, variations. La lateral variations. So it comes to multi-directional, same thing as change direction. So multi-directional speed training. It's pretty self-explanatory. We're moving in multiple directions. Does that make sense? Versus linear speed training, how many directions are we moving in? Two, Really just one, thinking linear, straight. Does that make sense? Yeah. Not really a trick question on that one, guys. Didn't want to change you up. It's like we said, multiple directions we're kind of going through. To propel in multi-directional speed training, what do we think is something we need to make sure our athlete has, or something they have to work through? Think some demands our athlete needs to have good to be able to move. Good balance and stability. That's good. Yep. Anything else? Good adduction. Good, good adduction. Good adduction movement. More towards like balance and stability. Think more. Not so specific there. What? Flexibility. Flexibility. Similar to mobility. Good word. Yep. So mobility, stability. I'm looking for one more thing. Coordination. Not quite. Uh, not quite agility. More. Um, so thinking when we're moving multi-directional speed training, we want our athlete to be able to absorb and produce force in multiple directions. To propel themselves side to side. To do so, there's three kind of demands we have that they have to hit. One thing, which Trenton piece on, was stability. Being balanced and coordinated in those standpoints. What was what Maddie said? Flexibility. Mobility, yep. Yeah having the mobility to get into different angles with the body. The last piece is our strength to mass ratio. So being strong enough to move their mass. Is everyone aware of what the strength to mass ratio is? Or our goal from a strength to mass ratio. So how strong or how much force you can produce compared to the mass of your athletes or how much they weigh. So if I have a 300 pound athlete that can only produce 300 pounds of force, it's a one-to-one -one ratio, not quite great for putting them into an aggressive angle from what's direction. So our goal right here is to make sure our athlete is strong and powerful enough to move throughout these angles, if that makes sense. But these are three things kind of we're looking at when it comes to change direction training. Are they first mobile enough to get into the angles I'm gonna to try to put them through? Are they second then stable enough in those angles? And third, do they have enough force compared to their body weight or overall body mass to propel themselves through that angle? Question, Trevor. How would you assess that? Like, how would you check where an athlete's at based on their strength to mass ratio? Like, how would you find that number? Uh, a lot of times it's like a weight room number, kind of seeing, but a lot of times you take them through a movement-based pattern. So say if you take them through your lateral warm-up or even what you had planned for your change of direction or your screening for that day, and you see, oh, they can't propel themselves at all, first you would test, okay, is it a mobility issue? Is my athlete unable to get into the angles? Say you test their mobility and they're good. They have the mobility to compensate for those angles. Is it stability? Are they unstable in those angles, going through different stability type drills, single leg work, balance work? Do they have the stability into those angles to propel themselves? If both of these are yes, typically the only last thing would be they're not strong enough to move themselves. So let's think of this a lot when it comes to younger kids training. When it comes, have you guys seen, especially with our rookie group we have in here, when we're moving them back and forth to five ten fives, who's seen a kid fall so far? A few, a few times, right? Um, the kids, young enough, they definitely have enough mobility to be in those angles. Especially at a younger age, their flexibility and mobility ranges, pretty high. Stability, hit or miss on those ones for a younger age group. Sometimes they have great stability, sometimes they don't. So that might be one thing. If I get an athlete, especially the younger athlete, let's take, for example, uh, Shane. Mobility, yes, he actually has a good example if you guys remember Shane. He actually is pretty strong for his strength to mass ratio, but his stability is not great. That makes sense? Same so vice versa, so you kind of put them in. A lot of times when it comes to a youth group, you'll see one and two hit, this doesn't hit. Now I think older populations, you might have one and three hit and two doesn't hit. 
So just kind of going through different tests and knowing how to piece together. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does it make sense how to look for that when you're kind of going throughout? So when it comes to multi-directional speech training, the biggest thing we're looking for is angles and angles in the body. So angles is going to be our relationship form. We always want to make sure what angles we're putting our athlete into is optimal to what they're going to be getting out of that movement or what we're going to be focusing on for that goal. Now, not only angles are we looking for, what's one big thing when we get a multi-directional athlete that we're actually looking to train them for? What's one big thing we're going to start this basically at the top of our whiteboard right here as well? Similar to angles, but not only push them into angles, but what type of angles should we be putting them into? Not quite, but not, don't think big, small, don't think angle size. Think, should it be a generic form of angles or something specific to what they're gonna see in their sport? Specific, specific, specific to their sport. So kind of a trick question there. So you want their angles, I always call it, give your athletes what they want. If my athlete is only gonna be getting into a deep angle in a side to side manner, thinking moving just linearly, Say if my athlete was just a 5 to 10, 5, 10, 5 sprinter, only ran 5, 10, 5, that obviously isn't a real sport. That was their only sport they had. I wouldn't put them into different angles except for outside push angles, which would increase their ability to move in that direction. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So when it comes to a change of direction speed training, you want to make sure it's very specific to what actually the athlete needs and what they want to gain from that session. How do we know what they want to gain? What do we do right when we meet our athlete? You ask them, yeah. And you find out, hey, what sport do you play? What do you feel like you need to work on? You see how they move. You're like, okay, yeah, that athlete can't move side to side. I need to make sure we can improve that greatly. Just like that. You just have to ask them. Be open talking to your athletes. Does that all make sense? All right, good. Now, our change of direction, our multi-directional speed is different. So... From reactive speed. Can anyone tell me another definition from reactive speed? I uh, think uh, Nick already said it once. So our reactive speed, so that means you're reacting to something that's typically what we call agility. So agility can also still be change of direction training, but change of direction training isn't always agility or reaction speed, if that makes sense. So when we're doing change of direction training by itself, there's no reactive component. When we change to a reactive speed training session or a reactive agility session, we're adding the athlete to have to react and move to something. What's an example of something reactive, a change direction reactive drill you guys have seen in here so far? Uh, when you move with their hand up and they have to move the opposite direction, side to side, shuffle. Yep, that's exactly, they're reacting to something. What the, were you gonna say? The one we did with Grant where I had the pad and he had to Jump cut based off your pad, exactly. So it's a different mechanic that you can take anything. So you can take any piece of change of direction training and change it into reactive speed. Similar to Colton with that cone drill. Is he always reacting to whatever cone you call out or whatever cone Isaiah comes out? Yeah. Exactly, so that's how you can kind of change it. They play a big piece together, but think of when you're just focusing on their multi-directional speed, it's a little bit more regressed version. So think it's more patterning and positioning versus adding in a reactive component. Does that all make sense? So when we go through, is your, oh, is your uh, cake done in the oven? Yeah, yeah nice. <laughs> Just kidding. So when we go through, biggest thing when we're coaching for a change of direction based speed session, we first want to ensure fundamentals. So what are our in fundamentals? Anyone take a guess? So we talked to him at the beginning of today already, at the beginning of our session. So strength <clears throat> slash power, stability, mobility, and along with stability, you can really call motor control. I know somebody threw that out there as well. These are our fundamentals. So when we first intro an athlete into a change of direction type day, I wanna make sure first they have these three fundamentals component. Are they mobile enough? Are they stable enough? Do they have the motor control to do this movement? And do they have enough strength slash power to propel themselves whatever I'm gonna coach them through? 
If they don't have all of these three things, should I then regress or modify whatever drill I had planned for them? That way they can get more out of it. Yep, exactly. So making sure that you guys know on the fly, if you have an athlete, one, typically you wanna meet your athlete first, but if you're an athlete where you program something and then learn, oh, dang, they aren't mobile enough nearly as I thought to get into the right angle or position to do this drill, or they don't have the motor control to perform this without falling all over the place, I need to, one, as a coach, hey, water break, let's step things back and change things up as we go. Does that make sense? So these are the three things we look for first when we're making sure we are going into a change of direction based in. Two, the second piece we want to make sure we're focusing on, we call this our change of direction speed. So kind of the work for the day. So when we're in here, piece two, we're focusing on a few things. First thing is our angle. So the angle of our legs we're going to work on. We're going to be focusing on our push leg, whether it's an outside or an inside push leg, which we're going to go through in just a second. We're also going to focus on our comprehension of the movement. So does the athlete understand what we're asking of them to perform? Which is a big piece to make sure we're actually excelling and progressing with our athletes. So going through this one by one, angles, what type of angle do we always want to or create? 45. 45 degree angle is pretty good of an angle. That way the athlete is propelling themselves the direction we want to go. I always like to voice it in more of a less specific term. When I talk to my athletes, more of a physics standpoint, I tell them equal and opposite uh, reactions. So we all know about force vectors, correct? So just telling the athlete when it comes to an angle, if you want to go sideways, their angle in proportion to where their push or their base of mass is being centered, which comes from what part of their body? Leg. The foot, the foot, leg. yep, the leg. The foot is what's connected to the ground. So their foot or their leg, if I want to go that way, I need to make sure I have an aggressive enough angle as I can that I'm pointed that way, that way my force takes me there. Does that make sense? So when you're coaching it, making sure your athlete's not always straight up and down, but they do have enough leg angle move to uh, compensately push themselves to that direction. Movement two, push leg. Now we've heard me talk about this a little bit throughout the gym. We have two different forms when it kind of comes to change direction speed training when we break it down, either an inside push leg or an outside push leg. The two basic pieces to that, when it's an inside push leg, so let's break these up into two categories. Our basic drill here you'll see is a crossover step. For an inside push leg. By inside push leg, what I mean is if I were to go trying to go right to me, left to you guys, which leg is my inside push leg? My right leg, exactly, because that's inside the direction of which I'm trying to go. Now, if I was trying to go right and I want to push off my left foot, what's that make my left foot? Outside push leg, exactly. So does that make sense? Both having a manner to go. That outside push leg base movement is called your push to base. So both are important in mostly all multi-directional sports. Both play a really key role, but knowing when to do both and how to do both, very important for the athlete to move in multi-directional speed training. Now, before we kind of continue with this, um, can anyone give me some examples of multi-directional sports that would tennis. need to focus on crossover steps and push legs. We'll go one at a time. Everyone give me two. Uh, for outside push leg. Just give me, it doesn't even matter outside or inside, just two sports that are multi-directional. Football. Football, okay, one. Basketball. Basketball, smooth. Uh, tennis. Okay. And baseball. Oh. Yeah, uh, ba football. baseball, outfield, definitely. Okay, let's go. Trenton? I was gonna say football baseball. Okay, can you give me two new ones? Um, Maybe soccer. Soccer, soccer huge. Change yep. Direction. Yep. Um, they're not. They're not specifically running, but maybe some certain types of mixed martial arts. They're not really running, but they still have to like change like their position, like where they're at. Maybe like shuffle side to side, like they're trying to move. Slightly, I wouldn't say it's more of a multi-directional uh, sport in itself, but you could you could justify. Ryan, you got two. Uh, lacrosse. I was thinking soccer, but you know, soccer sense is like, yeah. a lot more, a lot more change. Jake, you have two? Uh, hockey. Hockey, huge. I was going to say lacrosse, I don't know. Look, lacrosse, Matt, you got any more too? I Notice how this list is huge? I know, I was going to say volleyball and rugby, but... Volleyball and rugby, both huge. Really, when it comes to multi-directional speed training... Thank you so much, Jack. Uh, 
Uh, when it comes to multi-directional speed training, it's any field, court-based sport. Court-based sports kind of involve volleyball, hockey, basketball, stuff in that manner, and any field-based sport, really. So that's why I asked two. Uh, I could probably give you 13 more sports, handball, sand handball, everything like that, which is a change of direction or multi-directional sport. It's any sport in which the athlete is going to have to move in multi-directions. So think about that. Volleyball, you can justify side to side, or side to side, forward, back, everything going throughout. Almost every sport that we're typical to seeing is going to be throughout. Can someone give me, let's say, I want two total examples of a non-multi-directional sport. Golf. Golf? <laughs> Track and field. That was going to be my biggest one. Especially when it comes to um, our linear sprinters or our 100-meter sprinters. Very minimal multi-direction. Sometimes you can justify your 400 with the curve, but not enough to where you really get to a multi-directional sport, if that makes sense. Still running very linearly. Question. What about sprint, uh, swimmers? At least at the end of the like track or I guess the end of the pool when they the push the flip, yeah, they do the flip. Not Is quite a multi-directional, more of a uh, think of that more like golf. It's a skill specific movement. So very specific to the sport, but not quite a change of direction uh, sport for an aspect or a multi-directional sport. Does that make sense? What about water polo? Yeah. Also, nice. not water polo, just because of the motion. More of a rotational athlete. Um, you can't justify pushes off the legs. Okay. But it is a multi-directional sport being in the water, but slightly different in how you train. Okay. So, water sports, you can kind of get a little interesting, but... Cool. Awesome. Any last questions on what we kind of went over right there? Cool. Um, biggest thing we're going to go through now is coaching. A change of direction there or coaching a multi-directional speed net. Everyone got this down, right? All right, good. If not, we will have the video uploaded for you guys. Oh yeah, this marker is way better. Race is fine. Okay, so when it comes to coaching a change of direction net, typically you start with your change of direction or your multi-speed, okay? And you work your way into a reaction speed net. So a lot of times we'll have both in one, you won't always, but typically you want to progress from one to the next. Does that make sense? And does that make sense why? Well, didn't you say that um, like reaction speed could be like changing direction? So is that why like you get to change direction first and then go to reaction? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. So typically when it comes to change direction coaching, our last piece, which I didn't quite write on the board for you guys, but when we come to change direction coaching, obviously we went through teaching them angles, push legs. The last piece we want to do is introduce what I call chaos. So that's when we introduce the reactive ability. That way, not only has the athlete, I've already made sure they learned what I want to see from them. They've comprehended it and they're properly pushing off the leg of which I want for that day. I'm now introducing chaos to ensure the athlete learns and it's more typical to what they'll see in sport. So that's what we're kind of go through here and how we'll set up our reaction speed base day. Um, if we want to go through like an easy model, so I'll just say a, a model of first of a change of direction speed training. First, we wanna make sure we master, we learn and master our safe and control stimulus. So our stimulus being what? Our angle that we're coaching for the day and our push leg is our stimulus. And we wanna make sure we can learn and master it safely and under control. So the biggest thing we see here is slower progression based movements. So you guys have seen throughout these two weeks some single push to bases, double push to bases, different manners to where the athlete knows one, exactly what we're looking for. They might be slightly resisted or assisted to help them learn that movement, just like when it comes to acceleration. We're assisting or resisting them to make sure they're learning and mastering correctly. We wanna make sure it's under a safe and controlled manner, if that makes sense. So we always want to start our model with that. Make sure one, we're first teaching, and we're utilizing different manners to ensure they are learning and mastering the movement we want that. After that point, we're going to introduce scenarios. Where they may fail. But they can learn from it. So think of this, what's a scenario? Let's think of the push the bases and the reactive shuffles. First, I made sure they know how to push the base in a proper manner. 
We've tested it, it uses some resistance or assistance to make sure they fully master that movement. And then by adding in a reactive component to my hands of which they way they'll be reacting, that causes them one, they're doing the movements correctly so we can trust that they learn and proper them. But now they're failing somewhat, but they're learning to fail at a less rate. And they're now learning faster because they're having to move and operate at a quicker rate. Does that all make sense? And how you can progress one movement to the next? Okay. Everyone good with that? Um, last little piece when it comes to a change of direction day, reaction speed day, um, or any type of agility based day, you always have two reasons to do any type of drill. Uh, reason one, direct transfer to field of play. Now, what would be a direct transfer move, field of play for a linebacker day from a change of direction standpoint? Like a lateral shuffle. A lateral shuffle, so that push to base. And then, or, and then transferring it into a lateral shuffle. The athlete is going to shuffle and move just like that in the field. So why would I not train them and do a drill to where they're gonna have to do that? Does that make sense? Boom. Now the second reason, which is gonna skew more to the swimmer's answer or the golf answer, you're gonna build context to their sport. So now, like you were saying, when it comes to a swimmer or a golf, they're not technically a multi-directional athlete, but that doesn't mean I can't take them through multi-directional training and build context for that. Because think of a golfer who doesn't tr or isn't a sport where they are multi-directional, but a lot of the movements they do to where if they are swinging a golf ball, they are loading a lot of weight on an outside leg and force and pushing it, transferring it through the hips. Can we build context from any type of push to base, inside push leg or outside push leg training and build context into their sport? Cool. Does that make sense? These are our two biggest reasons, whether it comes to any type of drill, but really with reaction-based training or change of direction, multi-directional training, if we can build, or one, direct transfer the field of play, we're gonna do it, or if we can build any type of context, we're gonna do that drill, cool? Does that make sense? Let's move. We're gonna go out to the turf now. We're gonna practice some inside push leg and some outside push leg steps. Homework for you guys. Uh, I want you to choose either for a training day, same thing we're gonna film, um, an inside or an outside push leg, I'll let you pick, and then one chaotic base drill that you progress to from there. So when you guys make your filming, um, first talk yourself through, oh, I chose the inside push leg, I chose the outside push leg. Speak through what base movement you chose to teach your athlete who is you through that movement. And then I want you to conduct and talk yourself through the actual drill you chose with a little bit of chaos and a little bit of that reaction speed component. Does that all make sense? Cool. Everyone good with what we learned so far today? When you send out the, yes, but when you send out the video, can you like send like an instruction, like what you just said for the homework? Cause I wrote it down, but I feel like- Make sure you have exactly what I want yes. from the homework. I will of course, yeah. I'll reiterate what we want from the homework. Cool, awesome. Move, any other questions? Um, before you guys leave today, sorry Trent, I see your hand, I'll get you in just one second. Make sure you reach out to your mentor coach and set up some type of initial meeting for them or with you guys for one hour, or like not even an hour, whether it's a phone call, Zoom meeting, quick little 15 minute chat. Uh, just on something you feel you need help with um, or you feel you can learn at a greater rate um, and that way they can help you out. We'll start doing weekly meetings with them. But I want you guys to get in contact with your mentor coach today at some point, just shoot them a text uh, and get set up at some point for this week for a quick meeting with them. Cool, awesome. Any last questions for me? Trenton, what was your last question? Um, are we just gonna come back here and do We're gonna come back in here and do the interview, yep. Awesome, sweet, let's head on out there you guys. Great work today so far.